Hello, everyone, and welcome to Archaeobiting, and happy Native American Heritage Month. In honor of Native American Heritage Month, I've decided to do three videos on important subjects in Native American history. Today's video is about Pontiac's War, which is the tale of indigenous resistance in the wake of the Seven Years' War, and is the tale of the first truly large pan-Indian movement against European and American imperial powers. There would be others that preceded this, but they were smaller and more regional. This, as I said, it was pan-Indian. It was truly expansive. But before we get into that, we have to go over a question I'm sure a lot of people are asking. What is the Seven Years' War? Well, the Seven Years' War was what one could argue is the first, or one of the first at least, uh, world wars uh, fought between two allied groups, uh, with the main powers being the British Empire and France. And it was fought by these two allied groups over territory, as well as monopolies and trade, and uh, as well as other things. With one side consisting of uh, the British Empire and its allies, which included kingdoms such as Prussia, Hesse, and Schomburg in modern day Germany, uh, as well as the in North America, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, or also known as the Iroquois Confederacy. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy is the proper term. Uh, and then on the other side, you had France as with its allies, which included, uh, but were not limited to, the Swedish Empire, uh, the Mughal Empire, and Austria. And as I said, it was a truly global conflict. It was fought in North America, the Caribbean, which technically the Caribbean is part of North America, but sue me. Uh, North America and the Caribbean, South America, West Africa, Europe, um, India, Burma, which is modern day Myanmar, uh, and Bangladesh, <clears throat> and the Philippines. Uh, and again, it was fought by, between Britain and its allies and France and its allies over land uh, and trade monopolies. However, <clears throat> how most Americans know, uh, what most Americans know, the name that most Americans call the Seven Years' War is actually not the Seven Years' War. Mo the mo most Americans know the Seven Years' War by the name of the French and Indian War. And this is thanks to one just naming conventions of this particular satellite conflict that I'm about to talk about, but also it's due to uh, various types of media, most commonly both the novel, The Last of the Mohicans, and the movie that you see here on screen, Last of the Mohicans. And the French and the Indian War was the sort of satellite conflict, sort of, uh, Part It was part of the Seven Years' War, the part of the Seven Years' War that was fought in North America, uh, mainly in Canada and parts of the modern-day United States that were held by France at the time. Uh, and actually, the French and Indian War went on for a couple more years longer than the, uh, the Seven Years' War proper, making the Seven Years' War actually nine years rather than just seven but this was the, but the last two years was mainly con, uh, contained into the French and Indian War. Uh, and after this long, bloody conflict, <coughs> eventually Britain and its allies would come out on top, gaining all of this territory you see here in pink that used to be under control of the French Empire. Uh, and inducting it into the British Empire. Though, of course, there were still some lands that were contested heavily for decades, uh, with what is now modern-day Florida, uh, East Florida, and Central Florida, uh, having the yellow stripes, meaning that while technically the Spanish Empire lost Florida, it still claimed that Florida was its own territory, and it would eventually return with a military force and retake it, and it's a whole thing that would go on for decades well into uh, the establishment of the United States. So it's a story for another day. But the point of this map is to show that there were some lands that were still contested by the Spanish Empire, uh, as well as to show all the lands that Britain gained from France after Britain won the Seven Years' War. 
Which brings me to this area. Uh, this area, the Illinois and Ohio country, or Illinois and Ohio territory, were among the large tracts of land that Britain gained as spoils of war, as territorial gains, uh, when they won the uh, Seven Years' War. And after gaining this large tract of land, <laughs> including what is a uh, what would eventually include uh, forts Detroit and Fort Niagara, the British Je the British government would establish General Jeffrey Amherst as the commander in chief of North America, where he would eventually set up his base of operations in Fort Detroit. And Jeffrey Amherst <coughs> really actually sort of wanted this position. And that's because this would allow him, at least in theory, to gain a monopoly on the lucrative fur trade industry that you can see here. As the various tribes in the Ohio and Illinois country, which included the Wabanaki Confederacy that you see here, as well as other tribes that included uh, the Ottawa, the Winnebago, the Fo uh, the Second Fox tribes, the Potawatomi, uh, et cetera, et cetera, would t essentially they would go out and they would hunt deer and other animals. It is one of the most sought after was actually beaver, uh, and trade them to British forts like Fort Detroit and Fort Niagara to keep up this sort of monopoly on the fur industry and therefore would make people like Amherst a lot of money and by proxy would also make these tribes a lot of give these tribes a lot of goods like guns and uh, guns and ceramics and various other things that they sought. However, Jeffrey Amherst was also uh, fairly tyrannical and tre very fairly tyrannical to the tribes of the Ohio and Illinois country and treated them very badly. I mean, hence tyrannical. And a lot of this had to do with, one, <clears throat> white supremacy. He was a British general who saw himself as superior to these people that he viewed as savages who, of course, weren't savages, but still. But also because a couple of years before his uh, establishment, his appointment as governor, there had been a rather large regional war between the British and the Cherokee Confederacy, the Cherokee Nation, the Anglo-Cherokee War, which, as I've said, and I will link it in the iCard, as I said in my video on the subject, uh, was actually a fair victory for the Cherokee because they got everything they want and lost very little in terms of the war and inflicted a lot of damage on the British Empire. Uh, but the British still claim that they won. <laughs> but regardless of who won this war, though I do stay, still say it was a fair victory for the Cherokee, uh, this led Amherst to have a very suspicious view of the various tribes and nations in the Illinois and Ohio country, which already compounded on his white supremacist views led him to <laughs> very much mistreat the tribes in this region. And eventually this would all come to a head with, uh, under the leadership of two individuals. Uh, on the left, there was a prophet, a Delaware prophet, Lenape prophet is the proper term, named Neelan, who believed that the uh, great father, the, um, uh, the creator uh, wanted all Europeans driven from North America, uh, and eventually Neolin, with this message, would gain an, a powerful ally and the powerful Ottawa chief, Pontiac, who also shared these views. And this is Pontiac here on the right. Uh, and with this view, uh, and with this supposed prophet, uh, prophecy, Neolin was called the prophet, not to be, to be mistaken with Tim Squatawa, the brother of Tecumseh, who was also called the prophet, uh, with this prophecy, Neelan and Pontiac would disperse wampum or um, the wampum belts, which are a type of uh, shell belt, like you see here, that were used um, uh, to broker peace treaties and alliances. 
uh, and actually had various types of symbols engraved on, well, engraved is the wrong term, built into them, Thank, because that's how beads work, uh, designs built into them, which const actually constitutes as a type of writing. And they would dis disperse these various wampum belts to the various tribes in the region, as well as tribes as far east as the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, to begin cultivating an alliance, a pan-Indian alliance, to actually successfully drive, at least in theory, the Europeans, the British Empire, out of Ohio country, and hopefully even completely out of the New World. Uh, and this was done because both Neil Lynn and Pontiac recognized that the uh, Ottawa tribe and the Lenape, uh, really in no tribe at the time, was powerful enough necessarily to uh, fight off the British Empire on its own. I mean, yes, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy was powerful in its own right, and it had some successes, and same with the Cherokee. They had won a victory, a fierce one, but still a victory nonetheless against the British, but they had all come at a great cost. And so, of course, they recognized, Pontiac and Neolin recognized this, hence they began to spread the wampum uh, and forge alliance, alliances sorry, throughout Ohio and Illinois country. And eventually they would build a very large alliance. That, uh, and once this alliance was built, they began to act. And the first act of this newly formed alliance to drive the British Empire out of the Ohio country and out of North America altogether <laughs> was the siege on Fort Detroit, uh, which was actually a failure. Uh, but it was the beginning of this very long conflict. Uh, and shortly after this, this failed siege on Fort Detroit, the, the alliance under Pontiac would actually gain a victory in the Battle of Bloody Run, uh, forcing, uh, forcing many British forces to actually withdraw from the area. Though, of course, this would still face some mixed results. As you can see here, there were several very large-scale battles fought, not just at Fort Detroit, uh, but also Bloody Run, Devil's Hole, Fort St. Joseph, Fort, um, Fort Miami, Fort Sandusky. Basically, any you name a British fort in the area, and this alliance of tribes attacked it. Uh, they even attempted to lay siege to Fort Pittsburgh, which was also unfortunately a failure. Uh, and they, and the alliance, also lost the Battle of Bushy Run to the British military. However, as I said, they also were able to gain a score, a large slew of victories, including the Devil's Hole massacre, where this Confederacy ambushed a British supply train. Uh, mainly, this war force consisted of about 300 Seneca, uh, one of the few, the only uh, tribe of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy to join into the war. Uh, amb they ambushed this British supply train and killed over 100 British men and actually uh, temporarily ended British plans for an offensive in the region. However, the successes well to say just the successes the war itself the Pontiac's war despite the successes of the confederacy in gaining several key victories <coughs> in the war uh the public view of by the british general public the view of the war by the G british general public would actually uh begin to sour especially against uh Native Americans, Indigenous people in general. Uh, in fact, many groups, most notably the Paxton Boys, would actually begin to attack uh, and brutalize and massacre various peaceful Native American groups, including, uh, as seen in this picture, the massacre of uh, the uh, Native American students at the school, the Lancaster School, in 1763 by the Paxton Boys. And the Paxton Boys would also lobby and hold parades throughout 
uh, Pennsylvania and Virginia and various other places asking for brutal um, retaliation against basically any Native Americans that, uh, that the British Army came across, whether it be peaceful uh, villages or war parties. However, despite their efforts, many British politicians, including Benjamin Franklin and the Virginia governor, uh, John Penn, um, would actually view the Paxton boys as uh, extremists. That's the only way to describe them. They viewed them as extremists. And in fact, John Penn over here on the right would issue bounties on the heads of the Paxton boys because he viewed their actions as so abhorrent. Because again, he, 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 uh, and that, that says a lot, that even for the time, despite there being a large-scale conflict going on between uh, the Confederacy of Native Americans and the British Empire, that at least some politicians saw executing peaceful indigenous people as immoral. And again, this included John Penn with his bounties, as well as uh, Benjamin Franklin, who openly denounced the Paxton boys' tactics and beliefs in his newspapers and magazines and pamphlets. Uh, unfortunately, for, well, uh, yeah, unfortunately for uh, John Penn and Benjamin Franklin's efforts, um, another massacre would come along, the Enoch Brown School Massacre, where, uh, let's see here, I believe it, yeah, two, uh, two boys, and, as well as, uh, two boys, as well as Enoch Brown and six others would be massacred by uh, members of Pontiac's Confederation. During this time, Despite this massacre and despite the efforts of the Paxton boys, the British government would actually try to, at least to some degree, resolve the conflict peacefully. One of the ways they did this was by trying to keep other tribes who had not been part of the Confederacy from joining with Pontiac's Confederacy. Uh, and they did this by signing a treaty known as the Treaty of Niagara, with the Haudenosaunee Confederacy in 1764, essentially um, sealing the deal with Wampum and keeping the rest of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Oneida, Mohawk, Ondaga, Cayuga, and Tuscarora, from joining the Pontiac Confederacy, because, again, the Seneca had already joined Pontiac's war effort. Furthermore, uh, the Board of Trade, the sort of um, oversee the the oversight committee, if you will, of uh, Amherst and various other British governors, were decided that Amherst was not the right choice. That decided that Amherst Amherst's actions that had led to the start of this war meant that Amherst was not the right choice, and so they replaced Amherst with Thomas Gage. And Thomas Gage began to set up two expeditions. The first expedition was led by John Bradstreet, who left uh, towards the end of the war in 1763. Uh, however, uh, <laughs> uh, his expedition was fraught by... Uh, essentially what happened is his expedition left by boat in... Um, I want to say Lake Erie. I could be wrong, uh, but one of the Great Lakes, and they had, were caught in a storm and were forced to uh, seek shelter at Fort Presque Island, uh, an island that held a British fort that had built, been built in 1760. Well, sorry, French fort uh, that had been taken by the British that had been built on the island. Uh, and while on this island, John Bradstreet took it upon himself to... Uh, invite various member, various high-ranking members of Pontiac's Confederacy to the island uh, in order to negotiate for a ceasefire or really for into, into the war overall. Uh, and he made them a variety of promises that he actually had no authority to fulfill. And once the British 
upper echelon, the upper, um, excuse me, the upper echelon of the British Empire found out about this, they were not happy. Uh, and this is, brings us to the second expedition, the Henry Bouquet expedition, uh, an expedition that was actually supposed to take place in conjunction to Bradstreet's expedition, but had actually been delayed. And eventually, Henry Bouquet would leave uh, sh shortly after the illegitimate negotiations conducted by Bradstreet, uh, and this is roughly the route he would follow. However, this too would eventually end with uh, Bouquet also trying to negotiate for an end to the war with the various upper, uh, the various higher ranking members of Pontiac's Confederacy. Uh, and this time it would actually stick. Uh, there would be still some skirmishing going on back and forth, but this was actually the beginning of the end of the war uh, because the war had been going on for a while, and as I've shown, it was sort of really just a back and forth. The, the Pontiac Confederacy would gain victory, the British would gain a victory, and et cetera, et cetera, in much a similar way to a video I've already done, uh, the Chickamauga Cherokee War, and really even the Anglo-Cherokee War. Uh, and eventually, the negotiations would end with the British crown, the, the British king, King George III, declaring it, creating the proclamation of 1763, something we've talked about before, where essentially all land west of the Appalachians, um, under most circumstances, was restricted uh, the, the British citizens of the 13 colonies were restricted from settling west of the Appalachians. Let's put it that way. Which, of course, angered <laughs> the British colonists, and as I covered in my video about the Revolutionary War, was actually one of, not the only, but one of the leading factors that led to the American Revolution. Uh, but, you know, as for the, for the context of the video today, this was the end of the war. Basically, Pontiac and, uh, by proxy, also the Anglo -Cher the Cherokee and the Anglo Cherokee War got what they wanted. They they fought these protracted engagements, defeated the British in several battle several key battles, and eventually got a promise, a token promise, but still a promise nonetheless, uh, by the British Crown that the uh, that all remaining in, uh, land held by the Native Americans would be left to the Native Americans. Of course, it wouldn't last as well this long. It wouldn't last that way, but still, this was the end to the war. At least to a certain degree, because as I said, uh, the effects of Pontiac's war would be uh, felt for decades. One, as I said, it would be one of, again, not the only one, but one of the key factors in leading to the American Revolution, as well as it would be an inspiration to later confederacies that would be formed, uh, such as the Northwest Confederacy. Uh, one of the subjects we'll talk about, the, 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 we'll have a video this month for Native American Heritage Month. Uh, as well as drag canoe, sorry, dragging canoes, uh, Chickamauga, uh, Cherokee, and uh, Choctaw and Creek Alliance, is, and is even going so far into Tecumseh's Confederacy in 1811. So as you can see, uh, this was a war, this was a confederacy that was formed to drive out uh, the Europeans from North America, uh, a united alliance by various tribes to drive out the Europeans from North America, and it, it arguably succeeded to a certain degree. I mean, the effects of that success didn't necessarily last, but it did succeed, and it had a broad effect on three different confederacies for uh, several, over decades after. Again, Tecumseh's Confederacy, Dragon Canoes, Confederacy of the Cherokee, Choctaw and Creek, as well as Shish, as well as Shawnee, uh, and the Northwest Confederacy, uh, which consisted of all of these tribes here. Which makes which is why Pontiac's Confederacy, uh, Pontiac's War is considered the first truly big 
uh, Panamanian movement and one of the most important and long, and not only one of the most important, but also uh, one that had one of the most longest lasting, uh, one of the longest lasting legacies. All right, and with that, that ends this video. I hope you enjoyed it, uh, and if you would like to see me cover any other subjects, uh, or to you know cover any of the other subject, uh, so any of the subjects or um, events that I mentioned in this video in greater detail, uh, please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section, and remember to like, share, and subscribe. And I hope you all have a good day.